Hello, everybody. I'm Mira Phillips. I'm the project manager for Ships to Shores. Welcome to our interview with Bruce Kemp. Project Ships to Shores is a cross-country initiative created by the Broadreach Foundation with support from the Government of Canada and in partnership with many other community organizations. Our goal is to engage at least 2,000 youth between the ages of 7 to 30 across Canada in activities focused on the marine sector through four themes, arts and culture, economic activities, civic engagement, and history and heritage. Youth will participate in digital activities where they will share knowledge and culture, build skills in entrepreneurship and leadership, and create an increased sense of belonging. Head to our website, www.shipstoshores.ca to learn more. Hello, everybody. My name is Randall. Uh, I am a volunteer with Ships to Shores. And today we are going to be taking a very long voyage based on a book called Whales of Lake Erie. And I'll let you think about that title for a little while. And um, we have an excellent skipper for our voyage today. His name is Bruce Kemp. He is um, a lifelong journalist. He's the author of books and articles on many aspects of ships and shores. He's a publisher. He's an award-winning photographer. And uh, Bruce has a list of awards that you'd need a very long sheet of paper uh, to get them all in. Uh, dedicated small boat sailor. He's a scuba diver. He grew up in Sarnia right on water, and I am completely convinced that uh, Bruce has veins filled with Great Lake water because he has the knowledge and enthusiasm of that whole area of our country. So, Skipper Kemp, would you give us a sense of how long this voyage is, where it starts, where it ends, um, and uh, touch on where we're going? Well, basically, the, um, the voyage is about 2,600 miles, 2,630 to be precise. Uh, and uh, it began in uh, Duluth, Minnesota, which is as far west as you can go. It's, it's virtually the center of the continent. And it took me to uh, Pointe Noire in uh, Quebec, right on the border of Labrador and Quebec. Uh, on the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and then back to uh, back to uh, Hamilton, where uh, we unloaded uh, our cargo of iron ore. Uh, we picked up a cargo of soybean in Duluth, took that to Port Cartier, which is a transshipment point. It's uh, it's open all winter, so ships from around the world can come in there and pick up grain. And uh, there's quite a thriving trade at Port Cartier for this type of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, you mentioned- I should say that uh, the voyage was long enough. I wore out two sets of underwear, which was all I had because uh, the airlines lost my luggage and I keep two spare pairs in my camera bag. Uh, a wise journalist, no doubt. Um, <laughs> been there before. Been there before. And uh, in the previous podcast, when we talked about your previous book, um, Weather Bomb 1913, we were talking a little bit about how important way back then, 100 years ago, the Great Lakes were to Canada. And again, that has never changed, has it? Can you give us a sense of how much kind of traffic and how important um, these waterways are to the country and the economy? Yeah, um, you're absolutely right. Uh, the importance hasn't changed. Uh, a lot of our produce uh, or products go by sea to foreign countries. Uh, and the Great Lakes of the St. Lawrence Seaway system is the main highway for that. Uh, I believe we're the, you know, we're the second busiest waterway in the world after the Suez Canal. Wow. wow. And um, um so um, it is extremely important because a lot of uh, Canadian produce or products are bulk products, grain or um, um, wood chips. Uh, so they all go by sea. It's just really the most uh, feasible, economic, economically feasible way to send something. Yeah, and there... Uh 
in uh, Wales of Lake Erie, I mean, there were some uh, startling facts that, again, I never knew. I think you mentioned that in terms of the number of ships, we're into the, the thousands, like probably 4,300 ships a year are, are um, coming into uh, Canada by the water. And the other um, figure that astonished me was that the weight of all their cargoes comes up to like 40 million tons. So Ooh, there's an awful... Yeah, there's it's an awful... Uh, uh, a lot of people get uh, very nostalgic about uh, the great grain race from Australia to uh, England. And uh, that was that had a life of about uh, uh, maybe 90 to 100 years. And at the best of times, that saw only about 20 ships taking part in it. Uh, they would load grain in Sydney or Melbourne, and they would sail like hell around Cape Horn up to uh, up to uh, London. Uh, that's kind of a day's business on the Seaway Canal, on the St. Lawrence Seaways. Uh, you know, and and nobody nobody gets excited about that, and we should. Agreed. I mean, I I think when I think of Canada and transportation, I'm I'm definitely going back a long way because I think I associate Canada with railways and yet mm -hmm. from your book and the previous book um, Weather Bomb 1913 waterways we are a maritime nation and yet I always sort of look inland to the railway I don't look out to the waters and all the the ships that are plying them. Well, absolutely and you know I think if you measured it uh, you would find that uh, Ontario has more coastline than British Columbia. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and, think about that one. Yeah. Because yeah. we have the Great Lakes, plus we have James Bay and Hudson's Bay. Yep, there's a, a lot to discover. Um, that's sort of a drive away from wherever we live. And, uh, and yet, like myself, I rarely, I rarely do that. Um, the ship. Can you give us a sense of how big these guys are? Oh, the, these uh, bulkers, as they, call, as they call them, they go by several names, bulkers, straight backers, uh, <clears throat> four afters. Uh, they're huge. Uh, there's 700. This particular ship, the uh, Canadian leader, was 730 feet long. Wow. And uh, more than 75 feet wide. And... Uh, um, Give you an idea. Uh, I was uh, walking down the deck one day, and we had a. It was on Lake Erie, and we had a bit of a blow, and uh, wave came over the uh, gunnels and soaked my sneakers. And I thought, well, that's kind of unusual. Uh, and you know, I happened to mention it to one of the guys, and they said, "Oh, you know, it's a pretty good wave. Uh, you know, we've got 19 feet of freeboard right now." Right. Right. Um, yeah. And talking about sort of safety and waves coming over the decks, uh, you did mention that at one point uh, it seemed that a storm was sort of going to be brewing. And you mentioned putting on uh, your survival suit. Can you, it sounds kind of like a space suit. What, what exactly is a survival shoot, suit when you're on a ship? Well, um... First, uh, fortunately, we didn't have to get into our survival gear. I mean, it was just, uh, I started thinking about it. When you go as a guest on the ship, you're, you're taught how to put these uh, devices on. Right. Now, a survival suit is, is essentially a space suit. It's an enclosed system uh, with uh, seals around the wrists and a and, uh, set of booties in them. So, uh, you know, you can get in with your feet and uh, your feet are dry your everything is dry and it uh prevents hypothermia and it keeps you uh keeps you afloat uh hopefully long enough for the coast guard to pick you up if you have to go if you'll go in the water in one so it protects you not just from from the temperature but it so it is a flotation device you don't need something else to to stay afloat uh it is a flotation device uh, it has a um, it's an inflating 
tube on it. Uh, but the primary function of this device is to prevent hypothermia. Uh, lots of people die in light boats without ever getting their feet wet because they freeze to death. I see. Okay. So this suit then, uh, you would get into the suit, then you would get into the life boat. Correct. So normally you would not be kind of thrown overboard into the water. You would be in a lifeboat. Yeah. Yeah. Unless, unless it was something absolutely dire where, you know, you didn't have time to get to the lifeboat. Now on the Canadian leader, uh, the lifeboats were aft. So as I said in the, in the book, uh, you know, if something happened while I was in the galley back aft, I'd have to run up to my uh, cabin, 730 feet, right. get the silly thing on, run back, and hopefully the boat hadn't left me behind. <laughs> right, right. And um, in connection with those, uh, those safety measures, you had another um, curious term, which relates to the length of the boat and the fact that you could always be perhaps washed overboard by a big heavy wave. And these were called weather tunnels. What is a weather tunnel? Well, a weather tunnel is a tunnel that's uh, built on both sides of the ship beside the holds, but they're not part of the holds. Okay. Okay. And, and what these allow the crew to do uh, is to go from the forward part of the ship to the after part of the ship without being exposed to the weather. Um, there are there have been times on the Great Lakes where the waves have swept the decks clean, so you couldn't send a man back and forth on the deck, uh, okay. you know, to, to get to work and to stand their watches. They would have to take, you know, have to walk in these weather tunnels. Amazing. Okay. Uh, when we are on our voyage, there's a number of locks that we have to go through. And I guess the one that's most familiar to myself would be the uh, Welland Canal. And I was again surprised. Um, this is a very big boat over 700 feet. And I thought it would take not so much time, but uh, as you mentioned, it's nine and a half hours going through the Welland Canal. For people who aren't familiar with this system, can you just give us a, um, a sort of explanation? How do the locks and the canals work? What's their purpose? Well, their purpose is to overcome uh, geographic obstacles. The Niagara Escarpment is a, is a pretty good example of that. It uh, climbs uh, slightly more than 300 feet from Lake Ontario to Lake Erie. Okay. And uh, so you've got to have a way of getting up and down that if you're going to carry on commerce. Now, the Welland Canal was first built in 1829, and uh, there have been three subsequent canals since. Uh, the uh, canals work on a principle of uh, uh, admitting water to lock chambers uh, to raise ships or to lower them based on their buoyancy. And this is all that, these are environmentally friendly uh, machines. This is all done by, by gravity and natural flow. And so the, uh, the ship pulls into the lock, the big gates are closed. Actually, I'm working on a fascinating story about the gates on the Rideau Canal right now, but the, the gates are closed and they're watertight. And then if the ship is going up, water is allowed from the upstream portion of the canal to flood into that chamber. And the natural buoyancy of the ship carries it up just like an elevator. Right. Okay. Uh, and then going the opposite way, the ship pulls into the lock chamber. They open the sluice gates and the water exits and drops the ship down. It's all very gentle. You, you know, you just get this kind of very gentle feeling that you're, you're moving vertically rather than horizontally. Um, and um, when you say that the ship is over 700 feet long, so these locks, I presume, are even, uh, each of the chambers is longer than 700 feet. Yeah, they have to be bigger. Now, the Americans are just building a new pole lock. 
at Sault Ste. Marie. And this, this lock will accommodate the largest freighters on the Great Lakes, uh, the Degurtha, uh, which is over a thousand feet long. Wow. And uh, uh, that, I believe, is, is going to be in commission this year. And uh, so it's a, it's a huge lock chamber. Uh, there, there's only one lock chamber. On the Welland Canal, there are eight lock chambers. And then on, the, uh, on what we call the Seaway Canals, which are the canals that run on the St. Lawrence from uh, essentially just, just around Cornwall through to Montreal. Uh, there's the, um, there's the Boharnay one, Boharnay two, the Eisenhower. Uh, there's, I believe seven locks. Wow. And, to try uh, and um, when you mentioned the, Beauharnais lock. One of the other interesting little details in in the book was that you saw graffiti on the locks, and it was from literally around the world. Around the world. I mean, this is a uh, this is an international business. You know, we um, uh, we service the world. We feed the world with what comes down the seaway, and so you have. Indian ships, you have Korean ships, you have Spanish ships, all coming in to pick up uh, food and uh, minerals. Amazing. Um, one last question about going through the locks. And again, this was one which rather like the title of your book kind of span my head around because there's uh, this description where Suddenly, there are kind of lawn sprinklers on the deck of this huge boat. And I was kind of saying, lawn sprinklers? What's going on with watering the deck? Well, think back to grade 11 physics and Mr. Crenshaw. If you have metal that heats up, it expands. If you cool it down, it contracts. Now, these boats are very, very long, and they are flexible, and people don't realize that. You know, this, essentially, they see a skyscraper on its side, and they think, you know, this is immobile. Right. Uh, but they are flexible. And so, on a hot day, uh, what will happen is the entire deck will heat up, but the weight of the, weight of the cargo will flex it so that it drops as much as six inches at the forward and the after end. And there's a, there's a specific depth for the seaway. So they have to draw that up. And that's what they're doing when they water the deck. They're applying high school physics. Um, again, just, just a strange, strange image. There's so much in the book that is surprising. And as I said, it, 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 it made my head spin around. Also because I was very lousy at high school physics. <laughs> Through. So was I. <laughs> Definitely. Um, <clears throat> some of some of the details in the book again are are so unusual. And another one, if you can give us the context for this, it appears that back in I guess maybe the 1930s, um, old ships. I guess all wooden ships from the 19th century that when they came to the end of their commercial life, um, they didn't put them out to rest. They burned them. Yeah. So that was a tell very us about popular that. form of entertainment uh, at Niagara Falls and at, uh, <clears throat> at uh, Toronto at Sunnyside. Uh, with Niagara Falls, um, the uh, American entertainment empresario, uh, P.T. Barnum, actually loaded a ship, a hulk, uh, that had outlived its usefulness, with all kinds of animals, camels and, and um, uh, giraffe. I, I think I read giraffes. I could be wrong on that. <clears throat> uh, monkeys and uh, cattle and and sent it over the falls, uh, crashing over the falls to paying customers. Oh, my other, Lord. 
Others were set on fire and sent over the falls. The story in the um, in, in Wales of Lake Erie was about uh, uh, the last windjammer on the lakes, uh, and it was burned at uh, um, Sunnyside. And I happened the um, second engineer's oiler. Okay, so the assistant, the second engineer. Right. Uh, that was his grandfather's ship. And uh, he had uh, he had sailed that successfully. It's quite a story to it coming to Canada to begin with. It was built in the United States, uh, and this is the Lyman Davis. And uh, he had um, he had brought bought it and bought it brought it up from the states after jumping through a lot of hoops for the U.S. government. Uh, and he sailed it successfully until the 1930s, and of course. In, 29 the bottom fell out of the world right. and uh he wasn't making a living and it was also very hard to compete now windjammer um is a vessel that's powered exclusively by sail okay okay uh as a boat as opposed to a steamboat which uh um, by the point they burned the lyman davis um the the boats were now metal boats iron uh, riveted hulls uh, with big, powerful steam engines in them. And uh, so there was really no trade for these uh, wind jammers. So uh, the, uh, one of the entertainment uh, people from uh, uh, Toronto bought the Davis. Uh, and the condition was, is that he not burn it. Right. Uh, and of course, uh, I, I suspect it was all done on a ha handshake. Don Graham didn't really know, uh, but I suspect it was done on a handshake and the handshake's worth exactly how long it lasts. And, uh, this guy towed it out to Sunnyside, put fireworks in the rigging, bunting flags, you name it, uh, sold it and sold it and sold it and, uh, sold tickets to stand on the shore at the pavilion at uh, Sunnyside, have a drink and watch this thing burn. So it's, it's a, it's a strange, it's a strange image and it must've been painful for the man who sold the boat. I mean, I think sailors. I think a, it was, yeah. uh, you know, uh, talking to Don, I mean, his grandson, Don, when I met him, uh, I, he was in his, his mid to upper forties. And, uh, you could tell, you know, it still hurt him. Right, right, right. Yeah. And I, I guess that, again, I'm sort of, I was surprised because I would have thought that being a wooden boat that they would simply kind of dismantle it and kind of reuse the stuff. Was, was any that type of salvaging a, a vessel that had passed its time? Did they ever no. do anything like that? No. Uh, if they did any salvaging off them, they would, uh, there was a, uh, a period when freighters, uh, after they lost, uh, after they stopped sailing and went to steam engines, were built out of wood. And uh, uh, that uh, they were mostly wooden until the uh, turn of the 20th century. And then you got steel bo iron boats and steel boats, uh, all, you know, being, being developed. So the wooden boats that had steam engines in them, uh, they would salvage the steam engines if they were powerful enough. Uh, okay. Otherwise, um, I know of three, uh, three steamboats that uh, were sunk intentionally off of Sarnia uh, near a uh, uh, gravel quarry to form a dock. They, ah, they, right. they were sunk, they formed a dock, and they still had their engines in them. You can go and, and uh, it's actually shallow enough that, it, you know, if you can hold your breath for a half a minute or a minute, you can, you can pop down and, and s snorkel on them. And there, there are all the, the engines and the propellers and uh, the radiators and everything is still there. So there wasn't much sense of recycling or reusing back in those days. No, we were building everything new, everything 
more powerful and more powerful and stronger and you know so there was there was no sense of looking back or reclaiming when you were i think hitting the saint lawrence the gulf of saint lawrence there was a term in uh, wales of lake erie which i had seen before but i'd never really had an explanation of it and that's I guess they're Latin words, Fata Morgana. Ah, Fata Morgana. It's what, an optical illusion. <laughs> it's an optical illusion that occurs uh, on the sea. And what happens is, is uh, because of uh, temperatures and mists uh, being generated, uh, you'll see off in the distance ships that appeared to be floating just in midair. Okay. Okay. And that's, uh, uh, and that, that term actually comes from uh, the Mediterranean uh, where uh, they said a witch named Morgana floated uh, ships on the horizon. And uh, it goes way back. I think I, the earliest reference that I've seen to it is about, I think it's about the ninth century, nine, 980, someplace around there. Wow. Um, so would this sort of be, I, I think most people are familiar with the term mirage. Is this kind of like a mirage? It, in the kind style? of like a mirage. Yeah. Basically this kind of the same effect. Uh, actually, uh, you know, sometimes you see them uh, do car ads with a mirage in the foreground and the car floating on it. That's precisely what Fata, Fata Morgana looks like. Cool. Okay. So <clears throat> this has been a long voyage. <clears throat> we sort of went all the way out to the sea and then we came all the way back. W what sort of what was what did you what was your takeaway from uh, the voyage skipper camp. What did did you discover things that you hadn't known before, or what were your impressions, kind of, when you stepped back on land? Um. Well, okay. Uh, one is uh, is I I came really to understand that there's uh, there is an industrial subculture here. Okay, so without becoming too uh, anthropological, uh, uh, these are people who live in an isolated world. You know, uh, uh, before the uh, advent of radio, uh, these guys were, uh, you know, as isolated when they were, once they were sailing, as, you know, the, the uh, mud men of New Guinea. Right. You know, they were... They were all on their own. So a whole culture developed around it. it has its own uh, folkways and mores. Uh, you you won't, wanted to ask me about things like birds in the wheelhouse, which I mentioned in the story. Yeah, uh, you know that's an old superstition, and and that's part of the part of the culture. So there's there's the one big takeaway is that you know I've discovered a new culture that's been out my back door for seventy years now. Right. Right. Um, so we're just kind of going to wind our voyage down in terms of your new book. Um, if people are interested, is it ready in bookstores yet, or is there a little bit of a time lag or it, it will be March 29th. Uh, Nautical Mind will have it. Sarnia Bookkeeper will have it. Uh, Finchers and Godrich will have it. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, the uh, Port Dover Museum will have it. I haven't confirmed that yet. Um, but um, it should be, it'll be available or it'll be available uh, mail order. Okay. Um, and... I guess we're going to say uh, the voyage is over. We're back on solid ground. Uh, our thanks to Skipper Camp for taking us to places uh, that we didn't expect. And certainly uh, 
we heard some stories that we didn't expect. And I don't know, Skipper Kemp, are you going to say anything about the whales of okay. Lake Erie? I, I will. I'm not going to give it away, but I will warn you <clears throat> that the captain and the chief engineer, uh, I've come to call Calvin and Hobbes. <laughs> These guys were the funniest characters I've met in a long time. And the Whales of Lake Erie comes from a story about a uh, skipper who uh, came in from deep sea to sail on the Great Lakes, got himself into a little trouble and involved a large marine mammal. Okay. On uh, that, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> that enigmatic note, um, we will thank our skipper for getting us out and back safely. And again, if you're um, interested in other stories of sh ships and shores, one of which is Skipper Kemp's previous book, um, Weather Bomb 1913. And again, a provocative title. If you want to know what that is, pick up the book. Um, you can find those interviews on uh, the Ships to Shore YouTube. And if you want to keep in touch with other activities that are taking place in Ships to Shores, please go on the website, shipstoshores.ca. And um, I guess we say thank you for learning a little bit about the Great Lakes. And we hope to see you again. Well, you're more than welcome, Randall. Um, uh, let me just finish by saying uh, I can be uh, uh, reached at brucekempphotography.net. And uh, I, do, uh, I do public speaking to yacht clubs and diving clubs. So if you want to hear more, get in touch. Thank you so much. More than welcome.